this is going to be the official sign for everybody um, to either um, get up and go to the bathroom <laughs> or to sit down and be extremely quiet. They don't know how to do that. We teach you over the next three days, you're going to learn um, how to be in silence. Um, <laughs> we're starting this meet meeting officially now. Um, uh, this gentleman next to me is Mr. Sutter, and I'm Mr. Klinghart, and these are going to be the hosts here for the next couple of days. Oh, does this record somewhere else? Yeah. Does this microphone work? I mean, can you all hear? I have this cotton feel on my ears. Does it sound okay? Yeah? Okay. So let us know if something doesn't work. Um, last time we had a, a fairly good sized meeting here was about four years ago when we had a meeting with uh, Jerry Buko was here, Chris was here, I was here, uh, McMahon. And uh, four years ago, um, at least looking back, I feel like we set a new standard for biological medicine, not only in America, but really for the, for the rest of the world. The Germans were here, and the, the messages went back that the uh, focal theory of chronic illness is now not a theory anymore, but that we have actually um, sincere and heavyweight scientists supporting um, that a focus in the mouth can cause illness elsewhere in the body. And uh, this, was, this meeting four years ago was very well noticed across the world and left his ripples. You know, the, the research that was presented then was uh, used in courts throughout the world to defend uh, dentists and patients in front of the insurance companies uh, to win their cases. And it was actually a landslide. It was a relatively small meeting with, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 people here. And it set a whole new standard ever since then. Many of you dentists in the room here have learned to do cavitation surgery in the mouth because you felt suddenly it was legit and you didn't have to do it trembling <coughs> and hiding you know, in your garage, um, <laughs> you know, hiding from the dental boards. But that was actually something um, you could offer to your patients. And many of you got infected with a bug, you know, which was when you, watch, when you witness and participate in somebody's healing, is the greatest joy that us humans know. And uh, many of you have gotten hooked, and I assume one of the reasons you're here is uh, to get more of it. And um, I can promise you there's going to be a great meeting here. Um, like most of you have noticed, some of the greatest minds in modern medicine are here in the room, and we're going to introduce some people throughout the next few days. Um, just going to mention uh, a few. Uh, Dr. Isles is here. Dr. Isles is one of my big old German heroes. He's a, a personal friend and only survivor of the Honecker team, the, the uh, two brothers that created and gave us neural therapy with everything that kind of came from there. Uh, the first ones in the world to really draw public attention to the problem of focal infections in the mouth and focal problems in the mouth. And uh, much of what we're doing has been an outcome of Honecker's work and really Dr. Issel's work, who is sitting over there. Just raise your, raise your arm for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm not going to introduce the, the people that are going to be speaking here, because uh, they're going to be introduced as we go along. Um, just on a, on a little bit personal note, um, the first lecture I gave in North America was in 1986 in Canada, in Toronto, and that's where I met Chris Husser. Uh, and he and I kind of recognized each other then as some pretty bright minds that kind of stood out. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> well, to, uh, to, to kind of say this more relatively, um, because we were in Canada, it's not so difficult to stand out. Because <coughs> <laughs> um, no, it's because the Canadians kind of have learned to be very shy. So there's sort of like a consensus in Canada that you kind of behave very shy and you don't let your light shine fully. 
uh, if you do, you get in trouble more so than you do here in the U.S. And the U.S. has sort of been the country <laughs> that I recognize you know, where you can turn your lights on a little bit more without being shut down right away. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> Chris and I later on became partners. We practiced together for a year. And uh, I learned a lot of the things that I know that I've been passing on to others from him. Mm, thanks. And um, the next big meeting for me was in 1990 um, at Orana, who we're going to introduce uh, later for those of you who don't know him. Um, uh, called me up and said he had scheduled a neurotherapy meeting here uh, in his hotel. And uh, the German teacher, who was my, uh, my teacher in neurotherapy, Dr. Hopfer from Vienna, couldn't come because one of his sons had just died in, a, in an accident very tragically. And um, Dr. Hopfer had recommended uh, that he knew that one of his students was living here somewhere in the U.S. He didn't quite know where, but recommended that I kind of do the workshop for him. And that's sort of how, how I got called up. And I said, sure, I come. It was like, you know, the meeting was to start, like, you know, at 9 o'clock. And this was like three hours before, you know, that he called me. It was something like that. You know, maybe maybe in the next, the evening before. And I got on the plane and came and taught my first neural therapy workshop. And uh, that was when I realized I actually um, can teach this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, many of us have stuff to teach, but most of us don't know that we can, you know, we think, well, you know, when you kind of look inside, the kind of all you see is uh, this big black hole, you know, you know nothing, <laughs> you know. It's only when you start talking that you kind of realize suddenly, well, maybe I know something, or from somewhere there's the stuff coming. And so that was here in this room that I discovered that I could do that. And um, I've been sort of going forth and back, you know, I've been learning stuff here in America and bringing it back to Germany and letting people pay for the workshops there, you know, to bring the American knowledge over there. And then doing the workshops, usually like the Germans that were there kind of kind of took me to the side and said, well, you know, what you were saying here, that was wrong. And I know more about this than you do. And like the Germans love to do that, you know, kind of take <laughs> you back to the side and say, I don't want to offend you, um, <coughs> but really like, you know nothing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, <laughs> The Germans taught me a lot of stuff, and I've been bringing it back here, <laughs> asking people to pay for it, to get it from me. <laughs> so I've sort of been in this lucky position to be this double agent. <laughs> and, and one of the things that always stood out was Ed's guidance. Ed, Ed Arana has sort of been my, my guide in, in this type of medicine. Um, he's always been 10 years ahead of his time, and always said, OK, well, Dietrich, it's nice what you're doing, but <laughs> read this, and he sends me another book or another brochure, another article, kind of guiding me in a whole new, uh, new area. And when when Ed became sick last summer, it was a very sad event for me, because I knew uh, that I couldn't count on him anymore, being you know everywhere at the same time, scanning like the world for for new knowledge that was out there, and so uh, pretty much passed on the torch to to the rest of us here in the room. Uh, to carry it. And I think as an introduction, that's probably <coughs> enough words. Like many of you have worked uh, with, with one of the teachers, you know, that are here at the meeting and know part of the picture. What we will present you uh, these next few days is a whole new level of practicing biological dentistry uh, and biolo biolo biological dentistry in a way that it applies to all of us, whether we are MDs or physicians or unlicensed practitioners of any sort. Uh, but the understanding that we, we're going to transmit here on this weekend, I think it's going to set a new standard, uh, not just for this country, but uh, I believe for the world. Um, we got our Australian representative here, Don Bartram. Don, lift your hand up so people know where you, where you are. Don. <laughs> Don has been the, been the <coughs> fearless, fearless leader of a whole continent uh, where, where there's not just kangaroos, um, <laughs> but there's a few people living in between them. And Don has been the fearless leader over there and really taking uh, biological dentistry there alone uh, to, the, to a very, very high level. Um, Don is uh, not just a dentist, but he's also a very gifted and brilliant acupuncturist and electroacupuncturist, and he introduced 
uh, everything we know about the use of the laser uh, in this country. I've been trying to spread his message here with uh, limited success. The Americans are very stubborn, you know. They think they still believe things have to be difficult and expensive um, to work. Um, so we're going to have uh, Don give us a little update on, on his laser treatment. But you're going to hear like a lot of um, uh, new things, new details on the things that we've established four years ago. Yeah, you're going to hear about the intraosseous neural therapy, uh, which I believe is the biggest uh, contribution to dentistry uh, that has occurred in the last 50 years. Um, we're going to hear about dental materials. Chris is going to present um, the, the latest on the surgical techniques, and I'm sure you're going to go off on, on many other things in your talk. But Chris, um, uh, anyone who's ever seen Chris uh, operate on a jaw um, knows that it can't be done any better. Uh, it's sort of like watching a Swiss watchmaker at his best, you know, fixing a watch. You know, sort of, I was, you know, I've never seen, I've seen lots of surgeons, but I've never seen anyone like Chris. And so you're going to hear from some of the best of us um, the latest of what we're doing. Uh, the intraosseous neural therapy was introduced to us by our Armenian friend, uh, Ara and Marian. Ara, just going to lift your hand up so people know who you are. Yeah. Um, uh, not many of you know the Armenians. Um, the Armenians in Europe are known sort of as the, yeah, well, I mean, I don't want to uh, boost his ego too much, but uh, in, in Europe there's a lot of reference that Armenia is considered by, by many of us so the seat of intelligence of Europe, you know, that the, the most intelligent uh, genes <laughs> in the gene pool in Europe uh, come from the area around Armenia. And uh, uh, no, it has nothing to do with my friend here. Like he <laughs> he's a <laughs> bad example of that, but he single-handedly, he single uh, while we were on a skiing trip, uh, he, he showed me this ad in a dental magazine showing me this uh, procedure, you know, where you punch a little hole in the jawbone and inject inside the jawbone. And uh, I instantly recognized that this was a, a breakthrough just as big as the invention of the nuclear bomb or anything of that caliber. And um, he has uh, taken this procedure now uh, very far and will introduce us to the details of that. Um, you know, my strength has always been the heavy metal detox and also the testing of things. So I think I'm, I've taken the, the idea of what to put in the jawbone uh, the furthest uh, in terms of giving you some guidance <coughs> of how, how we can maximize any of these procedures that we're doing in terms of injecting medications, what to inject, when, how much, uh, and all that. And uh, Bart Flick is going to be here this morning, and I know uh, Chris is going to introduce him, but he's going to introduce us to the iontophoresis. Uh, for me, that was very fascinating to learn that from Adorana, that there's somebody else doing that out there. Because some of you know that four or five years ago, we were lecturing on using uh, uh, iontophoresis in the jaw to treat the bone cavitations in our course, Neural Therapy Without Needles. Um, we sort of found that independently, just kind of by thinking about it. <coughs> and Bart got to it uh, in, a, in a very different way. But I think I've been climbing enough here, like, you know, about praising people and stuff. So I think, uh, Chris, I give this over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Always remember that we won the war, though. <laughs> Bob reminds me we won both of them. And because you people are so smart, I can never understand how we managed to win. <laughs> you <were> more. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Chris Husser. You probably know that already, so I won't belabor that fact. I thank my distinguished colleague, Dr. Klinghardt, who has taught me probably more about medicine than anybody else I've had as a mentor. And I see so many of my other mentors in here today, including Dr. Arana. The reason that we're here, of course, is because had suffered a catastrophic stroke in April. I guess all strokes are catastrophic, but uh, it almost destroyed 
almost wiped out his life. And if you look at the emergency room report, probably should have. He had some very good doctors, uh, allopathic, that, that if, you, if I can use that term, that did save his life and did a great job for him. Um, Dr. Klinghart helped out tremendously in getting him back to, uh, to what he is today. And hopefully, uh, the reason that we're here is to gain some funds so we can uh, get him back to work and uh, help him out for the rest of his life here. Uh, on a sad note, I need to tell, tell you this, one of our colleagues in Iowa, Terry Allender, died this week. He was probably one of the best cavitation men in the world, didn't believe in mercury, was a biological dentist. His boards had hounded him for two to three months. They wanted to take his license. There was a smear campaign in his local papers in Davenport that said that he was a quack and he was doing this and doing that. He died Wednesday night on his daughter's birthday. He left two children behind. So I think he's going to be here in spirit with us today. Before I introduce our next guest, I just want to say a little prayer, if you don't mind me doing that, start the seminar. And with Dr. Arana in mind and Dr. Allender in mind, we'll begin. Dear Lord, the great healer, I kneel before you, since every perfect gift must come from you. I pray, give skill to my hands, clear vision to my mind, signal sync to my mind, kindness and meekness to my heart. Give me signalness of purpose, strength to lift up a part of the burden of my suffering fellow men, and a true realization of the privilege that is mine. Take from my heart all guile and worldliness, that with the simple faith of a child I may rely on you. And you all as healers might want to consider praying before you do surgery on your patients or whatever you do in the morning, and I'm sure you all do that. I say this every morning before I work on my patients. So with that in mind, let's get started with the seminar. We have so much to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know Dr. Flick personally. Uh, last year, or it was probably two years ago, Dr. Arana sponsored a seminar, and my friend Bill Wolf was up here. And he said, Chris, you wouldn't believe what I saw this week. And this guy's growing digits on patients with electrical current and stuff. And that just <laughs> lit my wick, because when I was in grad school 20, 25 years ago, I started doing that kind of work with a buddy of mine, a biophysicist, who also died this year of a stroke. And uh, I said, this is a guy that I got to meet one of these days. Unfortunately, I haven't done that yet. But I'd like to introduce you, sir, Dr. Bart Flick. Bart is an orthopedic surgeon from Georgia who is uh, out there. And he's a wizard in his own right. He, I have a tape of his and a booklet. And I swear to God, he has pictures. And he's going to show those today, I believe, actually growing new fingertips on patients. The implications here for all of what we do are astronomical. So I bid you welcome Dr. Flick. Come on up. <laughs> Morning, sir. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Would you put this on, please? Okay, we have some slides we're going to pull up. Everybody can hear me okay? Okay, I'll, I'll get closer. Do we have a pointer to or just a... There was one right here. There you go. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. I'll try to keep this to the time limits that we have. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I'll give you a little of my background as we go through the slides. And what I want to do today is I want to show you a technique that I have used for the last 15 years in my practice that I think has tremendous applications in other fields. We're using silver, so we're using a heavy metal. But we're using the silver in a very unique way to create a field of regeneration. And it's the field of regeneration where the magic occurs and that's really what I want you to take home today. How it works, uh, I don't know all the answers. I want to show you what it can do in orthopedic trauma cases and what it can do in things from burns to fingertip amputations. So we'll start with the slides. Can we turn them on? Oh, I, I want to add this too. Uh, this is the second public talk that I have given and chosen to give. Him. The first public talk was a stimulation at Ed Arana. Uh, Ed pushed me into giving the first talk to a small group last year. And it was because of Ed I'm here today. 
Uh, I have tremendous respect for this man, and I'm really pleased that he's decided to stay with us and work on opening his heart. Okay, let's go. Now, electrical antiphoresis, it's a, it's a field that is not known. It's a field that has had very little work done on it in the past. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Now, this field started about 25 years ago in orthopedic surgery with the concept that we could put a wire in the middle of a bone, run a small current in that wire, and stimulate bone formation. The slide up on the left, this slide shows a, a, a typical rabbit femur. And then we put a, a wire in the middle of the bone and run an electric current through the wire, and we'll get new cancellous bone formation. What was found was that the type of metal that was put into the center of the bone had an effect. The slide on, the, on your right is a silver wire that was put in the bone. The reason this works is that bone is piezoelectric. This was discovered in Japan in the 1950s and brought back to the US. And we started using it to heal fractures that would be declared non-unions. We could put a wire in the middle of the bone, create the right electrical current, and with the right electrical current, stimulate osteogenesis. And it's that stimulation that would allow the fracture to go on to heal, which otherwise wouldn't. Now, this occurs normally in most people. They don't need to have wires put in their bones. They'll heal the fractures. But some folks can't do this, so we'll do this artificial stimulation. Now, in these studies that were started in Syracuse, New York in the 1960s, late 1960s, they put different types of wires in, and they found that silver was the best wire. But it's important to understand, in this case, we use the wire as, um, as a cathode. That is, to stimulate bone formation, we need a negative charge on that. This is the type of case that we see in trauma orthopedics. This particular patient came into the Veterans Administration Hospital in 1974 with this type of lesion. It was an open fracture dislocation of the tibia, stabilized with skin loss, ended up with this osteomyelitis of the tibia. And you'll see the bone just hanging out in the breeze there, um, dead, osmolytic, um, no way to regenerate it. Now, we took the concepts of silver to stimulate bone formation with a, a product that was developed for the Defense Department in the late 1960s, which took fabrics and plated fabrics. This was a company called Swift Metalize Incorporation. It was the first company in the United States to learn the technology of fabric plating. They could take copper, silver, platinum, gold, and put them on nylon. Now, the value of this was for electromagnetic shielding. This was a company, very interesting enough, who painted all, did all the gold platings on the east coast of the United States of the Capitol Domes. <coughs> they took that, the technology and metallurgy and applied it to coating fabrics. They produced a number of fabrics at that time. So we took the concept, if we can create the right electrical environment, put silver ions into the tissue with this fabric, we could have a dressing which would allow us to drive silver into wounds. And that's what we did. This is more material that came out of the Swift Metalizing Corporation. They still produce the fabric. And I'll go on record today as saying they don't produce the best fabric out there. This technology, by the way, is proprietary technology. You will not find this in the literature. You will not find this at the patent office, how to do this technique. And if you read the patents that are on this, you will be misled because the patents don't work. It's, it's a proprietary technology. OK, this is, the, this is the type of cloth. What they would do is they would take an already existing nylon and plate it. What we did then was to buy their material and put it into wounds and drive, elect drive the silver off the cloth into the wound to get an ionic gradient. Um, this would be a, a typical, this is a wound that we did in the 1970s. This is a silver cloth that came from Swift Metalizing Corporation. We just put it right in the wound, cover it with gauze, run a 9.9 volts. We chose 0.9 volts because when you go above that, you'll get electrolysis at the electrode, and we didn't want the products of electrolysis. We wanted just pure silver ions. 
and keep doing that, and bingo, you'll get um, uh, you'll get the wound to regenerate and heal. Now, this paper was developed by my professor at the State University of New York in Syracuse when I was a medical student. Uh, this was a lead article in the journal Bone and Joint Surgery. This uh, nobody did anything about this paper. I was the only one in the country who picked up on this and continued it and incorporated it into my practice. Um, it's a paper that took 15 cases of chronic osteomyelitis that had come into the VA hospital for a BK amputation. The patients elected to try this, con this experimental procedure. They went through it and 14 out of 15 went on to heal and they walked out with their legs. The 15th case, because he didn't want to go through the time, it took about two and a half months to heal these wounds, I uh, elected for the BK amputation so he could get on with his life. These were chronic uh, osteomyelitis cases on chronic VA patients who smoked, drank, were not in very good physical health. The same time, two months later, New England Journal of Medicine published an article on the vascularized fibular transplant graft, where you come in and cut out a piece of the tibia, take a piece of the fibula with the blood vessels still attached to it, put it in the tibia uh, with a section that you had cut out, put a nice uh, myocutaneous flap over it, and they would go on to heal. They had about a 78% success rate cost of about thirty to sixty thousand dollars depending on the length of the hospitalization. This technique cost about a thousand dollars or less. That was picked up nationwide because people could make <coughs> money on it. This technique was not. So I went on to residency, started my residency at the University of Vermont and by the time I became a chief resident I had a patient who came in year now is 1984, who ran a bicycle shop in town. Everybody knew this guy in Burlington, Vermont, who had had a very severe open fracture dislocation of his knee and a very commutated proximal tibia fracture. He underwent an open reduction internal fixation, which then went on and got infected. So he had the proximal half of his tibia infected and was scheduled for an, uh, it was really an interarticular um, amputation because the osteo had gone so high in the tibia. He said, look, I'll try anything. I got to be good friends with him. And I said, okay, let's try this technique. So I went to Human Experimentation Committee, got for approval to do it. Uh, we got all, we built our little generators, put them together, and uh, we started the cases. Now, the, it, when, you, when you start a new technique, and, all, and the, the joy that I have in presenting this to you all is that you are on the cutting edge of what you're doing. You're thinking people. You're people who, who want to get the best for their patients. And in doing that, you take a risk. And in my case, I had to argue before the Human Experimentation Committee, which currently is called the Institutional Review Boards, why I should do this technique. So I finally got to do that. They finally approved it. I had, then I had to go out and figure out how to build these generators. So I did that. I wrote the protocol. I had to culture the wounds every day to make everybody happy at the University of Vermont, and then I had to do the post-op clinical findings. Now, everybody's probably familiar with this book. The concepts, the basic idea for what I do was developed by Robert Becker, and I take my hat off to that gentleman. He is a great thinker, a very creative, creative person. Okay, this was the certain generator I had to build. I had to go back and remember what Ohm's Law was. And one of the problems we have as physicians, and one of the reasons I think this never made it, why nobody would do uh, this technique is that you had to become part electrical engineer. And most of us get stuck in our ruts of practice where we don't want to take the time and learn a whole new science, which I had to do. I went back and redesigned this and built the generators. Can we advance that one? Can we in individually advance that one on the right? So we did this case that I was told the, the boy, this gentleman needed an amputation. It, it felt like I was trying to put an airplane together, trying to fly something with just material out of my backyard. And, and that's what happened. Well, I got to look at this case. And this is, you can see right here, this is just bone sticking out in the breeze. This is, this is raw bone. If you did the standard techniques, 
for this without doing any any grafts or transfers or any any surgical procedures that bone would go on to continue to die you cannot treat this wound with standard dressing changes you have to do some type of flap coverage over it well I wanted to prove them wrong I want to show we could not this was our first generator we built I had to get the pharmacy to prepare the dressings uh, which is the silver cloth and I gave everybody a little sample of the cloth so you can see the type of material we're using we're beyond that stage now as far as the manufacturing, weaving, and the knitting technology that's involved with this. Um, let's see, can you advance the one on the left? One more. No, the other. No, no. Uh, take this one back and advance that one. Okay, this, this is fine. We're okay here. No, no, this is fine. Now, if you can look closely, this is 12 days out after this, uh, uh, basically it's a debridement uh, uh, saucerization type surgery, is that out of the little haversion canals, this is the posterior cortex of the tibia, out of the little haversion canal systems, I got granulation tissue to grow out. That absolutely blew my mind. That was not supposed to happen. I was getting regeneration of granulation tissue growing out of bone in a wound that's, that nobody had done it or I hadn't seen it done before. But you get a dressing that looked like this, you get this kind of uh, whitish slime on it, which was a little concerning to the nurses. They thought, oh, we're still dealing with an infection here. Well, when you take that whitish slime down to the lab to look at it, you got, this is what you look, this is what you saw. There's a bunch of polys in there. You can see that very few bacteria. But we got some little pycnotic cells. Not pycnotic, but they're, they're very dense cells. Well, I later learned that that's a fibroblast in a dedifferentiated state. And that's how this stuff works. It causes the fibroblast to dedifferentiate, to go into a more primitive cellular form, and then allow themselves to make more copies of themselves which gives you the concept of regeneration. Now, you can see he's, this bone's covered now with granulation tissue. And what happens in all these cases is the granulation tissue continues to grow until the entire wound is covered. And then the skin starts to march right across the wound. There's no more surgery. This, this is something the patient does to themselves every day with a dressing change. So we've taken a very complex, difficult case and we've given it back to the patient with daily dressing changes and they'll go on to heal. Now this was a difficult case because he ended up having an osteo that extended up into an area just distal to the tibial plateau. So we had to take him back to surgery for another surgery and resect more of his proximal tibia. Uh, can you advance the one on the left? Yeah, okay. So you can see the, 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 the hot bone skin showing the proximal tibia just to be alive with activity, which means we had more infection. So we took a, a German technique, which I really love. You take a methylene blue dye, intravenously inject it into the patient, and turn him entirely blue. Even his bone turns blue. Wherever there's blood supply is blue. So we, we make him a Smurf, which the <laughs> nurses loved at the time. They couldn't believe it. But where you have dead bone, you're not, you're, you'll, have, you'll have an area of whiteness. Now, see this is, you can see up in here, this, is, this has not been dyed. Okay, there, so there's area of necrotic dead bone in that area. Okay, this is after the dye ran out. Now, they, this is an experimental type procedure. You have to get IRB approval to use it in a, in a clinical setting. There's no side effects to this dye that's injected except one. If the patient expires while the dye is still in his body, he hasn't excreted it out, the families get very upset. <laughs> <laughs> He's blue. <laughs> and that, we did worry about that a little. Okay, so he went on. Well, meanwhile, we had resected. Now, this is the first case I was in. I was sweating this whole case out, you know, cause, and I had all my attendings looking at me saying, God, you're crazy. You know, go ahead and amputate this guy. He said, no, I want to see if this works. So we ended up cutting more and more and more and more tibia out. So you can see we're right back to the posterior cortex and we're getting right up close to the knee joint. Well, meanwhile, my residency time runs out. I start private practice and I promised them they kept doing this technique and he went on to heal. 
he, we saved his leg. And this, this, area, this area up here filled in just like this down here. Now this was a chronic alcoholic, a smoker. He had, his protoplasm was the worst you could find as a patient. Regardless, he went on to heal. He was a, he was a walking swamp. Okay, so, <laughs> could you advance that one on the left? So I, I finished practice, married a woman from North Georgia, and moved down. <laughs> <laughs> and she, by the way, my wife is a fire chief, and she's running the slides right now. So. Um, and, and said, okay, I'm going to start doing this in my private practice. I, I had several opportunities to work to get appointments at medical centers and universities. I chose not to because I saw the politics that were going on in these centers was something that I personally didn't want to play with. So I elected at that time to cr go into solo private practice and continue with this technique. Now, sometimes as a treating physician, when you're explaining this to uh, common people, <laughs> it's like, this is the electricity, doc? What are you doing? This is crazy. But I have enough patients. In the community I live in now, I've done enough of these cases where if someone gets a cut or an amputation, they said, send them to the Radio Shack doc, okay? Because <laughs> we put little battery units on them. Okay, now this was one of my, my heroes in the, in, the, in the classic allopathic fields of medicine, William Halstead. Uh, William Halstead said, since 1984, we have uh, covered our fresh wounds with silver foil and are quite convinced that this is a dressing, this dressing has appreciable chemical as well as physical value. Ninth published Journal of American Medical Association, 1913. <coughs> Can you advance the one on the, it doesn't seem. Okay, historically, I'm gonna run through a little history of silver, much of which you may know, where we stand in silver, and then I'm going to go through clinical cases. So you can see how this technology is applied. Uh, silver has been around for a long time. Uh, in the last uh, 100 years, there are two substances that were on the market, Credes antiseptic and Credes ointment. Argerol, which gave Mr. Barnes literally a fortune and by 1910, and it's interesting, the greatest art collection in North America was put together by Mr. Barnes, who sold Argerol. Argerol went from sales in 1906 of zero. By 1912, it was the sales of eight, eight to nine million dollars. This took off like wildfire because it was the only type of antibiotic or anti-sepsis uh, solution that was, had some effectiveness to it. Silver wire sutures were developed by a guy named Dr. Sims, particularly in GYN surgery, where he had to do episiotomies or you had to do surgery around the rectum. It was sutures that were basically silver wires that would not get infected. Then the silver foil. Now their silver foil was sold commercially between 1913 and 1928. You could buy it out of a supply house catalog in Boston. The reason that's important is, is this gave us precedent to go ahead with the silver dressings as far as a 510K application to FDA and grandfather clausing this in because this was sold before. This is why the silver colloid boys and girls in America are able to sell this product, because it was sold under the, pre under the name of Argerol and Creedy Solutions uh, back before the FDA came into existence. Oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. Um, now, the oligodynamic aspect, this, this, this goes back a long time. The word oligodynamic came from a Swiss physicist around the 1890s where if you put silver onto any solution, a small amount of that silver will iron to freeze off into the solutions. That's why they made silver drinking vessels, the old remedy of putting a silver spoon in wells, cowboys dropping silver dollars in water, and silver foil in wounds. Uh, can you advance this one on the right? Okay. Th this is Appalachian speed bumps. <laughs> now, I... <laughs> I actually thought I knew the literature. Um, I went through and I had, I had every article that had even used the word silver in it um, until I started looking at the water treatment literature, which is a whole body of knowledge that is not in Index Medicus, which is not indexed in any of the medical journals. That gave me a whole other area of information, like another speed bump. 
And then in the fabric and textile world, these boys work in totally different journals. And there's literature in those journals on plating metal fabrics and the medical uses of it. The electrolyte delivery systems. Now, I, I played with this in, in swimming pools. I think this, this was the body of literature that I learned about. The systems do work. There's some inherent problems, and in it. it's a copper or silver system that they electrically inject into the solutions as they're going through the pumps or a pool. Recently, the Gold and Silver Institute in Washington reported that one of the major uh, aquatic zoos uh, was using this in their dolphin tanks. And the dolphins were doing fine <laughs> at a very low level, probably around four to five parts per million. Drinking water systems have used silver for a long time for their antiseptic, antibacterial. Catadine being the principal one out of Switzerland, but there's an American company called American Water Purification Systems. And they make everything from drinking straws to municipal water systems. So it's a recognized <laughs> area in the water treatment to uh, treat an for antibacterial. Chemical delivery systems in silver, okay. You have, you, you usually hook silver ion up to another molecule. In this case, silver nitrate. We all have heard of silver nitrate. Uh, the problem is the nitrate moiety is very caustic and the silver moiety is very beneficial. The caustic overrides the beneficialness, so silver nitrate has its, has its drawbacks. Silver sulfadiazine, developed by Dr. Fox at Columbia University, is a good drug. He developed it because of the silver. Not the sulfadiazine moiety, although the sulfadiazine moiety is an excellent antibiotic. But bacteria will develop resistance to the sulfadiazine moiety in silver sulfadiazine. They will not develop resistance to the silver. Different types of colloidal suspensions, suspensions and there are two products, the silver uh, thiosulfate, which is a slow release, there's a Japanese company making a product, and the silver hydroxyapatite. Again, it's another product that's, that's trying to get into the market as an antisepsis. Uh, and again, I've mentioned most of the silver drugs. The uh, silver uh, uh, norfloxacin, that drug is, is off the market. Silver sulfadiazine has about 40% of all burn markets in North America. Uh, silver nitrates also used in certain burn centers. And the silver colloids are starting to get a comeback. The FDA started rising their heads on silver colloids because it's made by a lot of mom and pop organizations who are not concerned about the colloidal particle size. My feeling is the particle size is important. Because if the particle size is too big, you're going to have renal and hepatic problems. That's not been proven. That's just my speculation. Uh, the key uh, to utilization of silver is how do you deliver silver? And the reason this system works is that we're delivering it on a nanogram level in an ionic form, which then allows the ion to complex with the proteins, the extracellular matrix, and the intracellular substances. And that's why regeneration occurs. That's why dedifferentiation occurs in the cells. Can you, Could you run that by us one more time? I'd be happy to. OK. Oh, no, I'm gonna, that's going to be brought out as a theme over and over again. So I'll repeat that several times. Uh, the mechanism by which how silver ions work, or how silver works in this system. These are two products that are on the market. Uh, the one on the left was, is not in, sold in America. They developed this with the concept of an antibacterial membrane for floors, for telephones, for anywhere they would be in a, in a public meeting place, they would like to have antisepsis and antiviral. And Apocyter A uh, has been developed, uh, it's been written about, but it's, you won't see it on the market because the company that's selling it has not promoting it. Can you advance the one on the left? Microphone. Stay closer to the microphone. I will. Okay. Now, uh, silver colloids, there are lots and lots of claims out there. The claims are unsubstantiated. If they could use a silver colloid that created a particle size uh, clo close to the silver ion, then they would have something magical. But they don't. The particle sizes are quite large. Silver nitrate, as we talked about. The bacteriology. Now, I'll go back to 1974 again. When we were looking at to try to use these in clinical settings, we did a lot of bacteriology work. By we, I mean I was a medical student at the time in Dr. Bob Becker's lab, uh, and this is how we started. We took a silver wire, 
one with cathode, the other anode, and we notice these zones of inhibition. That's staph aureus around it. Mechanisms of how it kills bacteria. This is very spotty in the literature. Not a lot of work has been done on this. Um, in the staph aureus, it's been shown that it stops the septa formation in the cells, which prevents the cells from reproducing, and creates these dense and large mesosomes, which also interfere with the uh, reproductive phase of the bacterial cell. In E. coli, we do know for a fact that it inhibits a specific uh, enzyme which is important in the reproduction of the cell. The mechanisms, the silver ions, is that it, it affects the extracellular and it affects the intracellular environment. In the extracellular environment, we have many types that are called metalloproteins. Um, metallothionin is one and that takes a silver ion and, and grabs it as if it's a toxic substance. If you can get enough silver ions in there in the right form, you will get these nice little complexes of silver ions with collagen. That's the magic. When you are able to put silver into collagen in the right form, you create a battery. And the battery allows regeneration to occur. And I'll go over that as far as how that works in the blastema. But that's the key. Intracellularly, it's a mem basically a membrane-mediated function, we believe. Very little good scientific research has been done on that. It does get into the DNA, uh, into the nucleus, and it does affect the respiratory chain of enzymes. And it, this is a, similar to the cloth that you have. This is a culture of Pseudomonas. The Pseudomonas was planted. 24 hours after it was planted, the cloth was placed on the pseudomonas in this position. It sterilized the area under the cloth. 24 hours later, the cloth was lifted, <coughs> flipped over, and put on a new area of culture. This area continued to prevent the pseudomonas from growing on it. And, th and the other way we tested out the different cloths was we'd put the cloth into a pizza dish and we'd measure the zone of inhibition around the cloth. Uh, on the clinical patients that I did, you do cell counts, uh, I mean bacterial counts. As the day goes past, days go by, the cell counts, that is the quantitative, quantitative number of bacterial species or bacteria itself in the wound decreases. And you can see on the, on the slide on your right is that it has to do with concentration. When you run it from negative, you hit zero, you hit uh, a hundredth of a, a volt, and bingo, you start driving silver ions off and you get inhibition. Bacterial species, oh, I apologize, it's upside down. Um, 20 species have been tested. This was one of the studies uh, that was done that uh, looked at uh, bacterial, that these wounds and the, the types of bacteria that were in these wounds. We have not yet found a bacterial species that is resistant to pure silver ions. Now, this is, work that, this is work that Bob Becker did. This is genius work. He found that the distance away from the electrode was dependent of, uh, that the cells, depending on where the cells were located, the closer to the electrode, they would have certain morphologic characteristics. The further he got away from the electrode, the morphology would change. So it had to do with silver ion gradients. When the silver ions get to a certain concentration, the, the fibroblasts, in this case, change. He took three T6 fibroblast cultures. And what you can see is he, the further he gets away, these would be like mature fibroblasts. And the, the closer he gets to the electrode, he would get these bizarre cell forms, which we later realized were dedifferentiated fibroblastic cells. And what we found was there was a zone when you get into a certain zone, which is a concentration gradient, you'll get an altered cell form. Those are mature fibroblasts. In this area, those cells turn into these types of cells. This, this is that same zone. Now, we, we got these bizarre things where you have, you know, <coughs> multinucleated cells. You have cells where the nuclei were squirting out. Um, just things that shouldn't exist, we found. This, this is a, a, a picture of a, this, this nucleus is squirting nuclear material out. Now, we thought, well, could this be cancer? 
are we, are we inducing a potential cancer? You take the silver ions out of these tissue cultures and all the cells revert back to mature fibroblasts but in increased number. Then you take the silver ions and inject them into fibrosarcoma tissue cultures and the cells stop dividing. We had a group in um, Missouri who injected these into malignant melanoma cells. The cells stop dividing. You pull the silver ions out, the cells go back to mature cancer. Again, to reiterate, this is what the mucus type material looks like on the membrane. I'll answer all questions at the end. I want to move on. Okay. I'll tell you a little history of silver fabrics because this is fascinating. The first company I talked about, Swift Metalizing Corporation, they produce a fabric now that is used in San Antonio in research. The fabric itself doesn't meet the quality, the ISO 9000 or the GMP ratings by FDA as far as quality control. Sequoia Industries, they make an excellent quality product, but it's all monofilament. Now, the product that you have can be made by Sequoia. And then this group called OmniShield, these are the guys who founded Sequoia who broke off and formed their own medical products company. And then what we did last year is uh, a dressing manufacturing company called Cush Industries made a strategic partnership with us and a strategic partnership with Carolina Narrow Fabrics. And we have the capability now of knitting yarns, non-wovens, and woven fabrics because we want to have the capability to take this technology into the dental arena. We want to take this into the plastic surgery arena. And we have to have the fabrics made correctly. The plating technique, it's a proprietary. And you go, if you go to Swift and you say, how do you do your stuff? That's the answer you're going to get. Um, it's, it's a chemical bath process. It's a process where the whole fiber is coated. So there's no shadowing effect. This is not a, a plating process electrostatically. And, and different, pro different fabrics vary in their ability to be plated. Silk can be plated. Your uh, synthetic polypropylenes cannot. Can we advance that one? Let's see. OK, history of plating fabrics, just very briefly. It started out in the carpet industry and then moved to the Department of Defense. Do you remember when you were kids, you'd walk on the carpet and get shocked? You don't have that anymore. Because what they're doing now, what they started in the 70s, is putting conductive fibers into carpets. So the static electricity gets drawn out. Originally, it went to plated fabrics. Now they're going to carbon filaments. Electromagnetic shielding, big business in in making a room electromagnetically secure so some, somebody can't eavesdrop with you, on you. Uh, making gaskets for computers, gaskets for doors, and in the grain industry. These bags, the, in, you know, the concept of grain explosions from dust particles being in the air, if they'll use these bags that have silver fibers in them, they'll prevent the dust explosion. They've gone from there into more carbon fiber bags now. Okay, benefits of silver nylon briefly. That's the response you sometimes get when you talk about I'm going to try a new technique with some of my patients. I'll give you an example. I took, and you'll see some of these cases. I put some of my cases together. I had, oh, I'm sorry, I had about 40 uh, fingertip amputations and 38 of them were workers' comp injuries. If you do a lot of work in workman's comp injury, you'll have a complication rate that's three to five times what the <laughs> national average is for that problem. The biggest problem we have in fingertip amputations is neuroma formation, neuroma development. This will prevent a worker from going back to his previous job. In these cases, I never had a neuroma form, which means that we're getting some type of regeneration. No reported allergic reactions to pure silver ions. Now, if you find one, please let me know. I would love to hear about it. Uh, we put a very, very low quantity of silver into the wound, nanogram level. Now, when they were using Argerol, these patients were drinking gallons of this material, so much so that they developed a disease called Argerosis, and they would actually look green. They would have this, this, this greenish-type tinge to them. Even with that quantity, that body burden of silver, they never became liver toxic. Has a long shelf life. The stuff lasts forever. The cloth you have, you could put that on a, on a cut uh, five years from now or today and it have the same effectiveness. Um, stimulates regeneration of mammalian cells. And 
this can be a cheap process. When we looked at, we worked out the economics of making dressings out of this for wound care, we only talked about increasing the price of that dressing, the manufacturing price, by five or six cents. <coughs> Clinical cases. This is the way I felt when I started. Uh, blind, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I really wasn't sure what to <laughs> expect. Twelve years later, I feel very comfortable in this technology. I've had every possible complication you can imagine. Uh, and out of these cases, probably 400 cases plus, I've had three or four failures. And I'm sure that was because there were other things that I did not recognize in those patients. The original cases were done for chronic. I use this on chronic and acute trauma now. Uh, can you flip that one? Again, this was a paper that started it all. Uh, very briefly, I'll make a couple notes here on the, uh, there are a couple papers that uh, were published. If any of you want a bibliography on silver and silver paper, uh, silver ions, I'd be more than happy to send it to you. Send a, an envelope, uh, an 8 by 11 envelope with your address on it to the address that's on that little silver uh, sample that you had. $15 and I'll send you, it's a multiple page uh, bibliography. I'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, animal studies, not much has been done. There's two primary areas. One was Joe Spadero in Bob Becker's lab. He was a colleague of mine at Syracuse. And the other is a, a fellow named Chu down at Fort Sam Houston. He's doing more work on this than anybody else in the world at this point. And they're developing this for the concept of burn dressings. Uh, silver nylon in vitro, I'm going to go fast. These are all in the bibliography. They have different studies basically showing that the silver and the silver cloth form is antibacterial. Urinary catheter systems. This was interesting. What they did in Japan is they took urinary catheters, coated them with silver, and put them in patients. Now, 25% of all patients who have urinary catheters get bladder infections within three days. So they're guaranteed 25% of all patients with Foley catheters and are going to get infected. With these uh, alterations to the catheter, none got infected. Uh, clinical studies, those were two that were spin-offs, Bob's, and then his, the, his predecessor at the VA hospital, uh, Dwight Webster. Okay, this was a product that was developed by a plastic surgeon in Texas uh, where he took uh, pig skin, coated silver onto it, and then put it on, the, uh, on his open wound. He got fairly good results. However, the company failed to get FDA approval. They were selling this on the open market. Three years down the line, FDA came in and said, why are you selling this? Oh, well, where, where's your paperwork? Well, we don't have any. So they shut him down, and they're not making it anymore. If you could advance that one on the left. OK, I'll reiterate this. Concept, regeneration, newt salamander, or limb amputation. Group of cells form at the end of the stump that's been amputated. These cells form a, a structure called a blastema. A blastema has little nerves that grow into it. Those nerves that grow into the blastema maintain the electrical potential. As long as that electrical potential is maintained, the limb continues to grow and regenerate. That picture on, the, on your right shows the neural epidural junction. Now, what do we do with the silver? This is the magic, is that we create the electrical signal as if we have a neural epidural junction. That's how it works. I'll show you some of these cases. One was a fellow who, my first case I did on a fingertip amputation, the wound closed to look great. It was the, he amputated the whole tuft off the distal phalanx. I had him come back eight months later, and he had regrown his fingerprint. So I continued to have regeneration even after the wound had closed. OK, and this is the concept. OK, back to the bio battery. That's, this is how, that's the magic of how this works. You have to get the silver into the tissues in the right form. And it has to complex with the right material. And once it does, magic. Uh, if you could advance that one. OK, why has silver been forgotten? Well, I think it's been forgotten because there's no economics pushing for it. There are no economics in 1997. This is a product that can create a self-sterilizing dressing. This is a product, when delivered in the right form, can heal a lot of the lesions that you see in the mouth. The reason I like this is that you get a continuous supply of silver over a 24-hour period of time. Now, these dressings would stay on. I would run this little generators. Now, we can make the generators to drive this silver the size of a quarter. 
It doesn't have to be. We can even make the generators that could go inside a dental splint where you just change the fabric on the dental splint daily and you get a continuous supply of silver into the mouth at a nanogram level. Now, I, I'll just digress for a second because I think it's interesting. We can make this material in a, it looks like cotton. And I would be more than happy to send this to anybody who wants to try it. If you put this in your mouth and you sleep with it, just you pack it up between your gum and your velar ridge. Please, I'm not a dentist, so I don't think in your terms. What you'll find is, and most of the times it'll stay in all night, what you'll find is it'll change the, the feeling that you have in the morning, which I'm convinced that it alters the flora in the mouth. And that's using just the oligodynamic aspect. Okay. Let's look at some trauma cases. You, this one. Okay, this is, my great, this is my favorite case. This is my family case. This is my wife's first husband, who's not an easy person to deal with. <laughs> he cut his foot on a lawnmower, knew that I was doing this technique, calls me up, begs me, because he's facing $35,000 of more surgery. Says, can't you please feel my foot? Well, you never did anything for my wife or her children when they were growing up. Why should I do this for you? <laughs> but the greatest thing this guy's given, my wife and myself, is this case. He's donated his foot. Okay, so this is what we started with. This is three weeks down the line, an infected foot, which 50 years ago would have been a guaranteed amputation. He'd been on oral antibiotics and still had this infected foot. He, he was a two-pack-a-day smoker and an alcoholic. Okay, we apply the silver. You can actually see one of the screws that's sticking out, hardware sticking out. We can grow new skin over internal hardware. That's not done with any technology that I know of. Okay, this is changing the dressing every day. He did his own dressing changes. Running the silver in through the cloth. This is a month later. Okay, a month after that, it's closing down. We still have a little nidus of infection. He won't go to surgery, so I have to do a little debridement in the office, pull the rangers out nip off a little bone, get down a good bleeding bone, and continue the case on. Three months later, he didn't show up for three months, okay. He'd call, he lived about, uh, well, he lived in Asheville, which is about three hours away from us. And so he kept doing it himself, and I wasn't sure how reliable he was, but he kept doing it, and by, by late spring, totally healed up. Now, a cost with the dressings and the generator is about $800. He was facing $35,000 worth of plastic surgical procedures. And he, did, he basically, we gave control of healing this wound back to the patient. And that's what I love in my practice, is trying to teach the patients how to heal themselves <coughs> with this technology. This is another case. This is a fellow, uh, a welfare fellow came in with osteotibia, an infected area. Again, this is a blow up on the left of this area. You can just see a hard uh, cortical bone uh, would have required some type of myocutaneous flap. We didn't, we just put the silver on it, and bingo, he starts to grow out, granulates tissue up. Now this guy didn't drink and smoke, so he healed twice as fast as my first case. Granulation tissue grows out, and it's a sequence going through. It's nearly covered to granulation, totally covered up by the 28th of November, and healed. Okay, this was a tattoo he had. Just to, I get some pretty rough characters. I mean, these are not, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do trauma, and these are patients who walk off the streets. Um, and again, it's, it's, um, I guess it's part of the service we provide. Uh, this is one of my most interesting cases, a 21-year-old fellow workman's comp injury. Look at the base of your, of your fingernail, index finger. He'd amputated right across the base. This is the, the bottom where the nail was. This is phalanx sticking out that's been amputated. So the distal tuft of the nail has been amputated. Granulation tissue here. This was at the day of the accident. Okay. Two days later, you can see it's starting to fill in, still bones exposed. He has nail matrix here, but his nail bed is gone. Okay, two weeks later, starting to fill in, nail bed starting to reconstitute. Can you advance, uh, advance that one? Two weeks, okay, nail bed's growing. Two months later. Now, it was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. Now that's just using this technique. Now this is interesting. I call this my karma case because 
three, uh, six months later, I'm out of town. He has the same machine, opposite hand, same finger, he amputates it. You know, like he didn't learn the lesson. So he goes to my colleague in town who doesn't do this technique, although we're very good friends. He does the standard procedure and amputates the finger right at the DIP joint. So he's got one regenerated finger and one amputated finger. Now, I ha probably have 10 cases in my practice where patients have been re-injured, where they've re-injured that hand or re-injured that extremity. What's bizarre, and I don't understand this, and my wife would call this woo-woo stuff, but it's, I don't know. When they re-injure that hand, the fingers that have been treated with a silver are not re-injured. They'll re-injure other fingers and not re-injure the fingers that were treated with a silver. I don't understand that, but that's, that's reality. And, and you stay around this business long enough, you'll see enough of these cases, you'll say, I don't know, it's there. Burn injury, woman, 28-year-old, uh, caught her thumb in a, um, one of these laundry presses, uh, started her on the silver, and basically no to full regeneration. But more important, that's in an area where the thumb flexes and extends, full flexion and extension of that digit. Uh, facial laceration, motor vehicle accident, came in, femur fracture. This flap of skin is up here. This is, this is skull periosteum. Okay, so you're looking right down, well, not on this one, but that flaps up, you're looking right down on the skull. And this is a close-up of the eye where you can see this huge flap of tissue. Now, what that would require is multiple plastic procedures. You'll close this with 7-0 or 8-0, do a plastic closure. But they would take multiple abrasive procedures to follow this. We started on the silver immediately. She had no edema swelling the first post-operative day. This is the first post-operative day. She did have some swelling on the lid, okay? But this was all closed down. Now, you will get some tattooing with this technique that lasts for one to three months. The tattooing all disappears. But if you use silver sulfadiazine on these wounds, you'll get permanent tattooing on the face. OK, this is a blow up a month later. This is what she's looking like. She had, she had cut right down, cut her whole uh, on the musculature around the eyelid. Cut, you can see where she cut the eyelid, too. OK, this is a, a close-up of it. Now, these scars should be twice the density. Uh, this is in this three months later. And again, it's just showing the pattern. Uh, these, these, you can see it's not even widened. There's a redness where the, where the skin was brought back together. And uh, this is the final result a year later. Now, she, we could do a plastic procedure, an abrasion on here, and she, you wouldn't see any scar at all. She doesn't have the money, doesn't want to do it, and uh, I said, fine. Now, oh, okay. This is this was another case. This was another case where this fellow had a near complete amputation of his wrist uh, two months before these pictures were taken. We we sewed all the tendons back together in the dorsal aspect plus his median nerve, uh, his ulnar artery, and three of the flexor tendons on the opposite side of the wrist. He had totally transected the hand except for he was still hanging, the radial artery, the radial artery was intact and uh, some of the, the flexures to the index, middle, and ring fingers were still intact. And that was it. So we, we were left with a skin slough here. The two tendons you see on the back of the hand are the extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi radialis longus. The importance of this is we've got tendons hanging out in the breeze. The standard treatment for this would be a flap. You've got to cover those tendons. You cannot get tissue to grow through tendons. Impossible. Does not happen. Well, it does happen with this technique, and I'll show you. OK, you can see the granulation tissue that's forming around the tendon. It'll grow over the tendons. And in this case, these are round tendons. Now, if you had a flat tendon like on a digit, the granulation tissue will grow right up through the tendon. And then the skin covers it, and then you get your motion back. In this case, the granulation tissue grew around the tendon. closing more and more, and that's his result. Okay, no grafting, just simple procedures. I want to give you ideas on how to use this technology in what you do. Uh, burn injury, actually this was a road rash, motorcycle accident, partial full thickness skin loss, started the silver. Oh, can you change this one? Um, and you get this beefy granulation tissue. Again, what I want you to look for is scar tissue formation. I'm sorry. 
Okay. Uh, continue on three, four weeks later. And, and this is this. All right. And th this is a result, okay? Minimal scarring, uh, normal sensation, even on the part that's full thickness. What that says is you are getting regeneration. Now, in, in these cases, are you thinking that uh, that piece of fabric? Huh? I'm not, you haven't shown really how you, how you apply this. Okay, let me finish and I'll go over that. Uh, this is a burn injury, a four year old child. Uh, water fell off the um, stove, burned her. Normally, this would have been referred down to a burn center. The family had no money. They begged me to do this, this technique with them. If it would work, I said, fine, I'll do it. And uh, that was, we took her to surgery, just cleaned off the, uh, the tissue. There is uh, parts in that wound that are full thickness. It doesn't, ha not totally declared itself yet uh, in partial thickness. If you use this technique, you, you will reduce your edema and swelling and you will stimulate healing and by 72 to 120 hours after you apply this technology te technique you'll have minimal pain. You we did daily dressing changes on this child by the fifth sixth day the dressings were changed without any pain. In a burn center this would require sedation. And I'll just go through the, the, the um, progression of how this wound went on to heal. Okay, we're starting to get granulation tissue forming. Uh, oh, by the way, the scar went up and included her breast, her breast nipple. Now that would have been guaranteed to have scarring there and disfigurement. Uh, again, it's healing, uh, granulation tissue. This is not painful. To change this dressing is not painful. And I guarantee you in a four-year-old with the fear that they're, they're living in of doctors, if you create any type of discomfort, you'll have screaming and yelling. Continues on month month later. Oops. Okay. Just continue on, and here we go. Okay. Now, I lost this child to follow up. This is the last picture I had. I I really wanted her to come back in a year. We couldn't find her. Uh, again, this was a welfare type of a case. Uh, the mom moved out of town, and child's gone. Full motion. Minimal scar contracture. She's going to have a normal breast tissue. Uh, uh, can you advance, advance this one? I think it's near the last case. This is a fellow who works in a lumber yard at home, hit, hit by a gunshot wound in his left leg that was 35 years old, had a chronic draining uh, injury um, to that leg. So it's basically scar tissue that's set up an area of infection. In the office, we debrided it, uh, started him on silver. This is, this is what it looked like close up. We debrided it, went down to basically right on top of the uh, Achilles tendon. And you'll follow this through. He took a while because this is a chronic problem and uh, went on slowly, slowly. And see, the skin pigmentation returned, interestingly enough. And on and on. Almost closed up here. Totally closed up here. Now that just doesn't look like a great result. But it's functional. There's no drainage. He's absolutely tickled pink. He doesn't have to wear a dressing anymore. Tickle black, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to wear a dressing anymore. And uh, maybe that's it. Oh, one last case. This, this is a fun case. This gal was trimming a hedge with her husband. She was holding the, uh, the uh, bush over. Her husband had the, yard, the uh, cutters and accidentally clipped her finger. And he clipped it down right down to joint, tendon, and this, this blackness, I had to cauterize the digital artery that was there. This is the first day after I saw her back from the emergency room. We started on the silver. This would have been a guaranteed case for a soft tissue contracture. And as you say, I wouldn't show you one that didn't work out. No, but <laughs> this did work out. Uh, continued with the silver. Now this took a little bit longer because we, we had her continuously move her digit. And there it is. Uh, okay, that was healing. Ad advance the one. Uh, okay, this is full extension. And this is flexion. Normal digit. 
Okay. Now, I got one the first case, and I, I, the talk is basically done now. The first case I did made me a believer because I saw things that should not happen happen. And every case I've done since then really makes, makes doing this technique in my clinic a joy. Patients love it. And I've had multiple of these cases where the patient would say, look, doc, if, if uh, 2020 or NBC ever wants to, please, please call me. I'll come in. I'll do anything for you. And again, these are folks, these are poor people who don't have a lot of money, uh, people who would not have gotten good quality care and now have normal digits. Okay. The technique is simply we take the dressing, the material like what you have, uh, we put it on the wounds. You can actually drop that dressing on the floor. I don't want you to blow your nose on it, but you can get it dirty, put it on a wound, put electricity on it, and it'll self-sterilize. Now think what that would do in an oral cavity. That's continuously infected. Continuous bacterial environment. You have a product that's going to create a local area of antisepsis. Now, you have to change the dressing every day because the electrodes, the silver does become chlorided and the amount of silver that comes off is less. It's nice to run it on the electrical gratings. You can do the oligodomic aspect, that is, don't use an electrical generator. The concept is you want a certain quantity of silver into the wound to get the biological effect. And you can do that by driving <laughs> down the electrical gradient. Question? No, I would say that would not work because the colloidal silver particle size is too high. Particle size, we're dealing, you won't get your collagen complexes with colloidal silver. You will get your complexes with ionto, ionto silver, silver and iontic form, yes. Uh, wait, wait, one, wait, wait, back there first. Ah, uh, that's an excellent question and I can't answer that. What particle size are we looking for? Um, and I can't even tell you what the particle size of the ion is, whether it's a, it's a clump of ions. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that we can get the tissue regeneration when we use, when we dry the silver down an iontophoretic gradient. We can't do that when we use colloidal silver. Uh, dry and socket? Ah, fantastic. It would work. Dry sockets. Can it be put in dry sockets? And uh-huh, you pack it in. In fact, we have the, the company that makes, um, uh, Johnson Johnson makes a product called New Gauze, which is a ribbon packing. It's similar to probably what you use in your dental practices. They are making for us, actually this week, uh, they are manufacturing the gauze that can be used in packing. Uh, we had to adjust the silver concentration on it so we could use, now that's not electrical. Okay, that's just packing it with and getting the oligodynamic aspect of the silver. No, I, I, again, I don't have experience in that, but I do have experience in working on the surface of the body. What I would recommend you do is you've got to open it up, put the silver cloth in there, and develop a splint such that you can change the cloth every day and run it on antiphretic gradient. Because that way you'll sterilize the cavity and you'll kill the bacteria and allow the body to regenerate itself. That's theory. And that's why some of you out there, I want you working with us to take the ball on this thing. And I, we will help you get set up to do this as far as the experimentation, IRBs, and all that. Okay. No, this is a, this is a surface uh, phenomena. This is a phenomena that works within one to two millimeters to three millimeters of the dressing, maybe five millimeters. Okay, now, I'm just gonna stimulate your imagination. Remember, we got, it, we got an electrode on the body. We're running half a volt. Well, you all know frequencies do lots of things. We can run a frequency <laughs> and affect the whole body through a surface electrode. <laughs> Gold, platinum, rhodium, you sound like David Hudson's friends. <laughs> Gold, platinum, and rhodium. Uh, Gold and platinum are platable substances. Rhodium, I don't know. 
Um, I can find out for you because I know the people who know how to do that. No experience. Uh, would you give us some guidance, like how long uh, every day do you apply the electric current uh, in, in your tank? These cases, and again, I think I think it's going to be discovered for dental uh, cases. The current supplied 24 hours a day, half a volt, and it runs between um, 50 microamps and. And as the electrode becomes chlorided, you'll drop down to 10, 6, 7, 8 microamps. Uh, six, it, it, you usually start out, because if you run the 24-hour period and you do your measurements, you usually start out about 50 microamps. And then you fall down to about 5 to 6 microamps by 24 hours as the electrode becomes chlorided. Question: Injecting silver into sarcomas and melanomas. Is there any practical application to widespread cases? The answer is I don't know. Someday there will be. It's frequency. Remember? Yes, sir. I think there's a real potential in that, tremendous potential. But there's a problem there. If you have to keep taking these two molecules from night to night for 24 hours, I'm guessing you would always be in your battery. I don't know. This is a good question. It needs to be discovered. Uh huh. This is really a hot topic in orthopedic surgery today um, because there are a bunch of. Okay, question is regenerating articular cartilage and joints. And this is a really hot topic in orthopedics. There are a bunch of procedures where we take cartilage, we take a plug of cartilage out of the knee, send it to the lab, we grow tissue, uh, that same cartridge, cartridge, cartilage cell, then re-inject it back into that area uh, with a covering over the defect. Um, I can't answer that because we're working on a project now that's proprietary, um, and I'll put it this way. Silver will be used in it to stimulate regeneration. There's nothing on the market today. How about regeneration of visual telomeral that months or years uh, have more? Okay, question of regeneration of digits that are totally healed and the skin is closed. You put silver on there with the antiparetic grading, it will not work. So no. it cannot be done then? Cannot be done. Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> There's a little showmanship on my own, myself. I'm not a snake oil salesman, but I'll tell you some history. If, if you have a child who's six years of age, and you amputate the digit like that boy had, he was 21, and you don't close that, the child will regrow that digit. Okay? If, if the child is 21, if the child's 12, it will not. So there... There I and if, if you amputate it proximal to the DIP joint, it won't work. There, there's a tremendous electrical phenomenon that occurs at joints, where you go from electropositive to negative, and then you shift out of the joint, you become electropositive again. We can't create. Now, if we can recreate that gradient, we could have regrowth of a digit. We're not there. Go ahead. When you say talk about all the shows and the work you have tried, but there is one thing I don't, I think that should be uh, looked into, which is uh, you don't have gone to this kind of barren area to the guy who's name of Costa Puta and he used to say, take some mud and put on a cut to give it soul and <coughs> Yeah, we don't totally sterilize the wound, which is interesting. What we do is we'll knock the bacterial counts down to 10 to the minus, 10 to the 2 power. We'll take it from 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8th, and knock it down to 10 to the 2. You can't totally sterilize the wound. So, 
Yeah, we are. We're 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 killing the good and the bad bacteria. That's a that's true, but we don't totally sterilize the wound. Dietrich. You will be able to, yes. I can't answer that. Within the next six months. I, when I talk, la this is the second time I've talked to a group, okay? The first time I ever came out in public was last year when Ed invited me out. Um, and I thought we were going to get something done at that point. Uh, and we haven't gotten it done yet. Uh, we do have a team together. Um, I formed a corporation with two fellows you may know, Dr. Steve Cabo and I, and um, a fellow named Dr. Mike Durkis. Um, Mike is an orthodontist and Steve's a dentist. Um, and we're working full time in this. We have a staff now. We've created uh, the logistics of creating this company. Um, and <laughs> if I can find someone to come in and take my practice, uh, you'll have it in three months. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you comment about uh, two things. One is, uh, have you done anything with keloids? And the second, toughness. Keloids are a great question. Have I done anything with keloids? I, I, where we live in Georgia, we don't have a whole lot of black folks. Uh, and they're the, great, the big keloid formers in, in my neck of the woods. The ones that I have, the keloids are definitely less. Um, they still form keloids, though. But they're not as large. Like that, that black fellow there, <coughs> he was a keloid former. And you could see a little hypertrophy of the scar, but not a great amount. Did it already form where it shrinks? No. Well, I, you develop, you know, we'll put the electrode on there, and I believe if you can hit the right frequency patterns, you can make it shrink. We're not there yet, though. How about temperature? I never, never played with that. I don't know. What about the level? Profoundly, profoundly. All these, these, are, remember, okay, question is, does, do these dressings lower the pain level? And the answer is absolutely. All these cases, the patients were changing their own dressings by 72 hours. Because once you get a nice bed of granulation tissue and you change the dressing, there's no pain. Because the nerve endings are covered by granulation tissue. No pain after 72 hours in most cases. <laughs> Bert, I, I can understand the, uh, the silver effect, but I've got to think that the electrical uh, pattern that they're setting up in the body, augmenting the, the electrical patterns that are there already, are what's really augmenting or healing, and the silver is more of a, 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 an antibiotic. Um, that's partially correct. The electricity does do an effect. Um, it's only half a volt and a very small amperage level. But... Um, What's, what's, what's interesting, if you take a uh, culture dish of cartilage, of, of bovine cartilage, and you drive silver into that cartilage, and this is the basis for one of our patents, um, and you take the silver dressing off, you'll get a back EMF off of that. So electricity is important. But what you're creating is you're creating electrical patterns in the body by how silver complexes with the extracellular matrix. That's the magic. So electricity is, is absolutely there. Okay. Well, uh, this, sorry. Uh, None. Question, has there been any uh, overgrowth or resistant organisms? And not to my knowledge. I'll give you a history of that. Question, was J&J going to produce the silver gauze? J&J evaluated this technology 10 years ago. They said... Nah, we're not interested because it's too much involved. We don't have clinical experience, and it's too big a risk. Please understand, in the United States, I'm the only doctor who has done this technique that I'm aware of. If you can find somebody, I'd love to, love to talk to them. You know, this is, not, this is not done. That lead article in the journal Bone and Joint Surgery, 78, nobody has picked up on that. You know, this is this is our premier journal in orthopedics. You know, um, are, are you using any, pulse? any what? Pulse. Am I using any pulse current with this? Uh, yes, I have. 
not a, none of these slides that you've seen here. No, this is straight standard, 900, this uh, 400 to 900 millivolts DC, continuous. Ah, I, I apologize. I mean, I want everybody's question answered. Let's start. No, I don't. I mean, that doesn't leak. It's just that that stays there as long as... Uh, Probably like the way psilocyphodizing. Again, I think it has to do with how it complexes with the extracellular matrix tissue, whether it stays forever or not. What kind of pulse frequencies? Like <laughs> what kind of pulse frequencies are we left? Well, I want you to tell me. <laughs> I can't answer that, but... But we're more than happy to open a dialogue with appropriate confidentiality statements. Yes, ma'am. With all due respect, have you had any FDA challenges? No, I haven't, because every patient I have signs a signs a informed consent. Um, even if attorney tried to take me to court on it, I, I've got every base covered. I have IRB approval uh, to do these cases. I've got the legal homework done. And if you all work with us, we will do the legal homework for you. We will have IRB approval. We will have consent forms, and you will be covered legally under an experimental protocol. The question is, have we worked with uh, bacterial cell wall and dark field microscopes? Cell wall deficiencies, no, we have not. Has uh, any work been done on uh, intravenous uh, injection of silver ions for uh, yeah. fungal? Work on intravenous injections of silver, such as through a dialysis unit uh, or something like that, or, or through one of the, um, um, we have withdraw blood and then treat it and then put it back in. The answer to that question is not that I know of. I know, I, well, a patent was issued. I got better at reading patents than I do medical literature. I can write a better patent than I can write an article for a scientific journal. Because I realized is if we're going to get this technology off the ground, we're going to have to protect it. And the concept is we want, in our, in our structure, we're setting up that a significant amount of all our money that will be made in the future is going to be put back into research. Um, there is a patent on that. Um, it's a clever idea. Remember, when you go to the patent office, you, all you have to have is an idea. You, don't, you can have no clinical patients. And unless they challenge you, you can, you can get a patent. That's why, that's why most of the patent material on plating metal onto fabrics is bogus. It doesn't work. Question. Remember, this is a concentration phenomenon. So uh, if you put the silver gauze in without uh, electrical stim, you're going to get an oligodomic aspect. You will get some silver going into the wound. You will sterilize within a millimeter of where you pack it. If you run one hour of iantafretic, you'll get more silver into the wound than you will not. Remember, it's the form which you put the silver into the wound that counts. And it's that form that does the magic. If you ran it for 24 hours, you'd probably get healing faster. Yeah, because it's it's a very very small quantity you're putting in. Ed, yes. Okay, question is, if, if you're able to alter the uh, gingival tissue around the tooth, do you find a distal effect in the body? That's a great question, and your guys are going to answer that for me and gals. I want you to tell me, and I'll help you. Yes, sir. Everybody 
really question. That's a great question. Huh. Can you <laughs> come on up? Come on up. Here. Ask. Can you pass this back? I'll try to answer it. Okay. The the question is this it? No. The question I posed to you was that in a lot of again a lot of magnetic therapy uses a negative charge field to create sedation or an acupuncture uses a negative charge or negative silver needles and stainless steel needles produce a negative charge field. Gold produces a positive charge field. So are you, in essence, by infusing the area with silver ions, creating a negative charge field by which to allow sedation or elimination or reduction of inflammation to occur, and therefore changing also the environment or the terrain so that the bacteria also does not thrive or, or the wound healing occurs or increases in that arena? <coughs> Great question. We are changing the terrain. We're making a positive terrain, though, because we the, what's driving the silver in Yes, we are. We are. You're creating now a, a positive field. Yes. And now, if that's the case, what impact would that be silver bell and mercury going to be very high because they would charge the fact that you're not coming with mercury and other ions to inhibit the process? Great question. How does the, uh, the, the inhibition from the uh, silver mercury filling slow down this whole process? Um, I have one case. And one case is myself where I would put the silver on the first I would chew and then we do the amount of uh, mercury that was released um, through the devices. You know, I, you guys know how to do that. Mercury yeah, one of the mercury vapor <coughs> things. And I get a certain level. And then I would put the silver in overnight uh, and then we did it again the following day and uh, I got out of all, it was half what it was. So does the silver uh, in ionic form or silver in the mouth in this form stabilize the silver mercury filling in my one little anecdotal case yes I would love to see you guys repeat that Mark, electrical current uh, stimulate osteoblastic formation are you stimulating osteoblast or osteoclast yeah osteoclast the classic in the piezoelectric theory that came out by Fukada from Japan is they're stimulated uh, basically by an anode. Um, the uh, osteoblasts are stimulated uh, by a cathode, um, which, which really gave us a lot of fear and trepidation when we started this work because of these, these tibias. We thought because we were using an anode that we were going to accelerate the osteoclastic activity and get bone resorption. Well, that didn't happen. So there, there's, there are so many other issues here in the extracellular substances that so influence us. Doing oral surgery, we want to get as much bone growth as we can and accelerate that. So. Yeah. No, it, it does not accelerate bone growth. What it does is it sets the environment or the terrain, and I think once you have a good environment, then the body can do, its, do what it's supposed to do. Yes. Uh, have you looked at the uh, growth factors that Only one? No, we haven't. Have, have we looked at growth factors being turned on by this technique? The only thing that I've done, and I hope to do a lot more in the near future, is a friend of mine at Clemson grows um, neuro, let's see. Um, no, the chrome, what, are, what are the cells in the, in the adrenal gland? Chromo, chromophytes? Yeah, chromaffin cells. He grows those. So one day I took over some silver cloth to him and he put it in a tissue culture, these cells, and the cells started budding started axonal budding. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get a mild regeneration in these cells from the oligodynamic aspect of the cloth only. Without electricity? Without electricity, yeah. There is one manufacturer that's local called Colloid that makes that a microparticulate uh, silver protein complex. Yeah. Uh, assuming, that you, assuming that you could take that further and truly achieve that, is it possible that you could use that to uh, stimulate fibroblastic I don't know. That'd be great. That, that was a complex question. Can you use? Is it possible to create a silver colloid that the silver colloid itself is of a particle size that will allow you to 
uh, create the same effect that we create with this high anthropogenic gradient? And the question answer is, I don't know. Great question. I'd like to know. Has uh, any experiments been done with uh, psoriasis? Using yes. <laughs> I have done some work with psoriasis uh, with some of my patients who've had other lesions, yeah. and it doesn't work. This did not work. Uh, uh, wait, over here. Here, Ed. Treats it basically is that he cleans them up first and he detoxes the heavy metal out of them and then he feeds them properly. And the day I was there, they had a contingent coming from Munich of 10 or 12 doctors, and they were going to give him a certificate, I guess, of recognition, if you want to call it that, and recognize his work. Um, and it was amazing to see these children uh, come in there, and they had scabs as big as a, uh, well, as big as a liver, peeling off of their faces, and their hands. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, teenage kids, uh, tremendously disfigured uh, due to their skin condition. And he was reversing all of these 100% down the line. And he had all kinds of medical records to back it up. And we, uh, we will invite him to one of our meetings to present this material. Uh, he has a Czechoslovakian uh, Romanian name. It's not Robert, but he's just, just calling him. Can you speak now? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. I can talk louder. Okay. <laughs> We would love that. We would love to have somebody do that. I mean, I'm just a dumb old country orthopedic surgeon who does this stuff, so. <laughs> right. Yes, somebody should do that. There's a tremendous amount of basic science work that needs to be done on this. And when this, is work, when this work is done, we'll open up whole other avenues and understand and even make this technology better. So we, we got to end pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you. 
function with the sub hydro groups directly. Absolutely, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the concept is is to remove the toxic burden in the area that you want to treat in a very simplistic way. If I could get some of my patients to stop smoking and drinking, they would heal faster. <laughs> well, okay, one last question. No. Can you get them later on? Yeah. No, I'm leaving. I'm sorry. No, we got to go. So. Okay, it's fantastic. <laughs> we need to talk. Uh, okay. You know, we're here to usher in the medical dentistry into the 21st century, and you're going to help us do that, and we're going to help you retire. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great lecture. That was fantastic. When I was in grad school, we started playing around with stuff about 25 years ago, electrical currents, and I never did anything with it, and I knew there was uh, some great beneficial thing there, and thank you for doing this stuff. I have two messages that are important. Mr. Paulos, P-A-L-L-O-S, please call home. It's urgent. And Mr. Uh, Philip Aronson or Dr. Aronson, call your office ASAP. We're going to take a break now for half an hour, and we'd like to have you visit the uh, exhibitors right next door, right just south of this room, right behind you. Half hour break. We'll start at 1130.